Well, thank you very much for that, and, and it's, it's great to be here. And, and I have to just have to say, you know, ever since we started this partnership with um, the Living Desert and Dr. James, it's just an amazing partnership, and that's what conservation's all about. So without further ado, I'm just going to share with you a little journey today. Obviously, I can't fit 33 years of field-based conservation and painted dogs into well, like 33 or well, an hour or whatever. I'll talk as long as you like. If you don't go away, I'll keep talking. So, you know, <laughs> I'll, just, I'll, just let, I'll just warn you now, you know. <laughs> so, um, the painted dog. 33 years ago, I started working with the painted dog. And, and actually, people often, a question I always get asked, I'm going to answer it right now. People said, how on earth did you get involved with painted dogs? And because and, actually, I was, I was a herpetologist. I was working for the Natural History Museum. I said, well, how did you make the switch, you know? Well, what happened was, was a little story here. I was in the Natural History Museum doing voluntary work, um, which I, well, most of my life's all been voluntary work, but I'm still alive, so I figure it can't be that bad. And um, I was volunteering to help at the Natural History Museum collect field data. And the curator of ornithology, the bird guy, came in and he, he said, uh, oh, we're going to Wangi National Park tomorrow for a field trip. Do you want to come? Well, of course, anyone says field trip to me, I'm like, you know, my tail starts wagging and I'm like, I'm there. <laughs> and um, so, so I said, when are we going? He said, tomorrow morning, uh, 3.30. I said, fine, I'm ready. Uh, I mean, to be quite honest, in the field, for a field biologist, you know, you take a pair of underpants, pair of socks, and that's, that's pretty much it. And in my case, you know, a few bags to put all the snakes in or whatever I was going to be capturing or looking after. And um, my field notebook, so you don't need much. And... Uh, I said, how long are we going for? He said, a month. I said, brilliant. Like, all the longer the better. And, and um, so, so we get out there, and then I suddenly realized, you know, there, there's, there's a, we say in English, you know, what a mistake at a maker. Because, um, because I get out there, and I suddenly realized ornithologists and herpetologists do field work in completely different ways, you see. Ornithologists, well, you know, kind of get out of bed at 3.30 in the morning. The first tweet, they beep, beep, and they're off, you know. Uh, and, and so, and then they're in the car and they're just driving around going, bird party, I don't know what a bird party is, I still have these ideas of birds drinking gin and tonic and, you know, Cuba Libras and things. And um, then they all stop the car and then they carry on. Well, a herpetologist doesn't work like that. You know, you wait until the sun comes up, when the reptiles come out, it's kind of more relaxed, you gently fossick under trees, and looking for reptiles and digging in leaf litter. And so I decided that the only way I could get data because I'm, I'm fixate, fixated about getting data. I want to get data on everything. And um, I'm probably taking data on you now, so don't, don't, just seriously. And um, so the only way I could get data was to sit on the hood of the Land Rover, on these dirt roads, hanging on for grim death. I was younger in those days, so I had a bit more kind of staying power. Uh, and every time a lizard or something crossed the road, I would bang on the bonnet and I'd say, stop the car, and they stopped the car. I'd collect some data and then we'd carry on. Well, one time they stopped the car and I immediately throw myself off the vehicle. I'm looking, right, there must be, I was like a trained monkey, you know. Uh, they've stopped the car means get off the car, there's a lizard. And I'm looking around on the ground and I can't see a lizard. And I say, where's the lizard? And the curator of ornithology stuck his head out of the, the vehicle and said, Greg, get in the car. Of course, I'm not listening, I'm just looking for a lizard. And I, I, he said, I said, where's the lizard? He said, get in the car. I said, well, I'm still not listening because I'm still looking for this bloody lizard that I can't see, you see. Because they, you know, they run like stinks, those things. And um, then, then finally he said, Greg, lions. <laughs> now, I was running around on a road that was width of the vehicle and there was a pride of lions right there. Now, they'd stopped to look at the lions and I'd stopped to look for a lizard that wasn't there. Well, we went back to the museum four weeks later, and I collected very little data, and I immediately disappeared into the bush, like, ooh, didn't get much on that field trip. And there was a, a guy who had just got a, this was 1986, and a guy had just got some seed money from National Geographic, because it was just when it was beginning to be realised that painted dogs were in a really bad way. You know, suddenly, like, someone had noticed, oh, you know, you start looking around and go, where are these dogs that used to be here? And like, oh, shit, there are none. Anyway, and um, so he got some seed money to start a project. And, and when he heard the story, he said, who's this Greg guy? And they said, oh, it's Greg. He works in herpetology. He said, has he got field experience? And they said, tons. 
that, you know, that's all he does for a living, if he can possibly do it. He said, I need that guy on my project. I said, and so he contacted me, and he said, uh, will you help me? I said, no, wrong person. I said, I work with reptiles. Didn't they tell you? you know? And he said, no, but you're a biologist. I said, yes, but I work with reptiles. So then he said, well, you can work with anything, can't you? I said, yes. Anyway, so that was, I said I'd help him for six months. Uh, uh, 18 months later, he wound up the project because it was hard to raise funds. Uh, but I'm still here 33 years later. And that was my introduction to the painted dog. And uh, so, just to give you a little bit of background, where I am, um, those of you whose geography is not very good, that's Africa. Um, uh, and, uh, but what is really exciting is that, I don't know what buttons I'm going to press now, is that in southern Africa, you know, dreams are, are, are what conservation is made of, and we have to think like that, and we have to think positively. You know, this big, huge chunk of land covering five countries is called CASA, the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area. I'm in a part of that mush. CASA, 15 years ago, was just a little idea. It is now five countries that are meaningfully coming together to form the largest large boundary conservation area in Africa. And actually, just to share, it was the participants at the workshop that Dr. James kindly hosted came from those five countries, so that we can start to really work as one unified team, one unified effort. And so that's where I'm based there, near Victoria Falls. I've had, still haven't had enough coffee yet. Um, I'm still shaking. Um, <laughs> but just to share with you, where do I fit in CASA? So we fit there. And, and in fact, um, all of us in CASA, like we have a CASA Carnival Coalition, we're, we're joining forces. And that's what makes teams what, are what makes it. And we're joining forces, and everyone's dog's got a job. So my job is to manage this patch here intensively for all carnivals, and so not just painted dogs, but of course painted dogs are my flagship. Uh, and in so now let me share with you, let me start taking you on my little journey of 33 years. When I started uh, painted dogs in 1987, the Zimbabwean population was, well, I did the first thing I did was how many dogs have we got? You know, what do you do? Look in the cupboard. Well, there were no, there were none. Mother Hubbard had been very busy. There were no dogs in the cupboard. And, and the Zimbabwean population was less than 200 dogs. And my first year working with painted dogs, it was clear the wives were beginning to be there. You know, the ranchers were shooting the hell out of the painted dogs. The second those painted dogs left Wangi National Park, they were shot. Within, within like a week, two weeks. It wasn't like, oh, they got there and they, you know, the ranchers were on their case. I can't, I'm just going to share a little bit, a little bit of, take you right back to the end. The end point was obviously that was one of my focal issues, was to collect data on what, what damage the ranchers were doing. Why were they doing it? You know? Oh, because they're eating our cows. I said, okay, fine, let me, let me do science. Let me find out, are they really eating your cows? And it actually turned out that they weren't really eating your cows, but we hate them, right? <laughs> now we know the real problem. Now we're dealing with the hatred issue. We're not dealing, you know. Uh, but just to share with you, after many, many actions and many effort on, by myself, and I didn't have a team then. I was, you know, I was a bit like, um, what's that thing where, you, where we've got a posse with a corral? There's a famous scene, it's Blazing Saddles, isn't it? And you've got one person there and they're running around the Indians to try and... And, and I said, in those days, I was a little one-man band. Um, but 13 years later, the last shot on painted dogs was shot. No painted dogs have been shot in Zimbabwe since 2000. It is the only country I know of in the world where a major carnivore, you stopped it dead in its tracks. It's over. It's a combination. It was a combi initially, it was a combination of kind of ha carrots and sticks. But now we have a changed perception. We have public that think differently about the dogs. And it, those that would shoot them won't do it because they won't be the favoured friends. Let me just share a little bit about... Now I'm going to move into when I started working with dogs. Well, the first thing that blew me away about painted dogs was their a social system, because to study a painted dog, it's like they're so unique. 
And for me as a biologist, they, very quickly I began to be totally captivated by this species. The one thing that captured me immediately was their social system. And, you know, starting to see, and actually I, I take a lot of pages of how I treat my team, how, how painted dogs work. Every single day, painted dogs have this what we call preemptive conflict resolution. So in other words, every single day when they wake up, every dog greets every other dog. So you can imagine if there's 20 dogs, how many greetings is? A mathematician will tell you it's 19 plus 18 plus 17 plus 16. But I won't give you the final figure, but it's a hell of a lot. And they all greet each other. I'm going to show you one of those greetings. But the way that functions is that if everyone is polite to everyone, that we all, you know, if we get up in bed in the morning and say, good morning, how are you? Would you like a cup of tea? Would you, I'm, you know, I'm concerned about your welfare. When you screw up later in the day, which we all do, I certainly do, you know, you're more likely to, to be forgiven for whatever mis misdemeanor you did, which probably wasn't deliberate. So I'm just going to share with you kind of one of those greetings, and it, it's kind of a little video here. So here we've got an alpha male, we've just put a collar on him. And he's just been greeted, he's just coming out of anaesthetic. I found him. Now, first of all, every single dog greets him. Just like when you wake up and not have to be bed like this, but you know. And now they've all greeted him, they're now going to all greet each other. It all happens within a space of six seconds. What you'll hear there are those very high tips, kisses and twisters. Uh, the more we try to understand this, the more we're beginning to realise that painted dogs have got a vocal capacity that probably equals that of a dolphin. They have a language that is enormous. We're also aware, by the way, that they've got a larger cranial volume than wolves. And that, I won't go into all the detail of that. But that's one thing about the painted dog that really blows me away is their sociality. They've got a social system, which I'm going to share a little bit with you, and how it functions, that is almost like at a pinnacle. The first thing is, is that they're, whilst they have, in the wild, they have an alpha male. He's a leader, you know? An alpha male and alpha females are equal, you know, co-lead. They co-lead the pack. They lead together. They make decisions. And they've got betas, which are the support group. And you've got the gammas that, yeah, they just tell me what to do and I'll do it. I haven't really, I'm not really Mr. Initiative. But what I love about painted dogs, and I'm going to share with this with a story, uh, is that they, everything is shared. So the gammas are not treated like, oh, you're just the gamma. You're like the runt of the litter. You might think the gamma. They're treated equally. And in fact, uh, whilst we always, when you're looking at study animals, you might think, well, let's look at the alphas. You know, I actually just enjoy looking at the gammas sometimes because they're dead funny. And, and we had uh, one gamma, I called him Magellan, after the famous explorer, because he was always lost. <laughs> and you may think, well, that's a bit of a, you know, oxymoron because Magellan was a famous explorer. Well, what actually happened was, was that Magellan Corporation had donated us two GPS units and they didn't work. <laughs> so I figured the dog and the GPS units were about as good as each other. Uh, it, it's got slightly better now, but you know, many years, the number of organisations that try to dump absolute rubbish on us is, you know, oh, that would be good for a conservation organisation. I'm sure, you know, animal captive collections have had vegetables, say, we've got some rotting vegetables, you want them for your monkeys, you know. It's the sort of like that syndrome that we get. And uh, Magellan was always lost. I, mean, I used to look at it critically as a biologist, but why are they putting up with, you know, what good is Magellan? He's always lost. And I think I remember that when he'd come up, they'd eaten and they'd be, they'd be like, oh, there you are. And they'd all give him, they'd all share. They'd all regurgitate some food for him, said, OK, well, you know, here's your share. Uh, and uh, try again, to better luck tomorrow. And then the final I remember was that the pack was chasing a big kudu bull, which is about a 500-pound animal from left to right. And Magellan comes running from right to left. I'm like, hold on a minute. And, and, <laughs> but he was chasing a rabbit. And I'm like, you know, Magellan, I'm not quite sure. You know, you really belong here. You know? But anyway, the pack thought he did. But what the packs are so good at uh, is that they're great at what we call division of labour. They know exactly which dog is suited for which job. And guess what? When it came when pups were born and it was safe, because you know, uh, Magellan was the babysitter. It's like, you sit, you stay there, and, and, and 
you can, you can serve your purpose, it's keep the pack going. The other, but then there were other things when I started to work with the dog because we had this, you know, one of the things I always was having was that, you know, you have to deal with all these urban myths, you know, like, I'd hear they're savage, ruthless, aggressive killers, you know, all that kind of loaded, you know, language. And um, my poor mother actually got to hear all that. And she, as soon as I told her, I said, Mum, I'm going to work with painted dogs. And she said, uh, I, well, I was going to work with wild dogs, that's what they called it at the time. The name has been changed for good reason. And um, so uh, she said, aren't they dangerous? Just the name. And I said, no, no, Mum, you know. Anyway, so Mum wasn't satisfied. She didn't just take me at face value. You know, she's like, I'm going to find out for myself. So she starts reading books. And in fact, in those days, the only thing true about painted dogs written anywhere was that they ate meat and they lived in packs. The rest was just complete you know, something, something, horse, something. And um, so, so she comes back to me and, and she, I get this letter saying, Dear Greg, you know, I'm really worried about you, you know. Um, I've read this book about, and this book was talking about pa pack of painted dogs, you know, a guy riding through the bush on a horse and uh, they attacked the horse and they killed the horse and he just got away with his life, you know, because they were going to attack him, but he escaped up a tree, you know, all this kind of Hollywood stuff. And um, she said, maybe you should go back to working with snakes. Work with puff adders and cobras and mumbas, you know. It seems, seems to be a far safer bet for you, my son, you know. She did love me, you see, you know. Um, but she knew I was always going to do this kind of stuff. And anyway, so I used to... When you work with um, a species for the first time that you know nothing about, in science, in, in field studies, you, we do what we call a latitudinal and a longitudinal study. And a latitudinal study is you take a subset, like in this case a pack, and you study them really intensively. And then you try to see whether all the other packs fit that sort of pattern. And that's the standard sort of technique. So I was doing the latitudinal study. It was a pack of 11 dogs that I was studying. And every, I'd spend 27 days in, a month in the field, and wherever they went, I'd try to be with them as close as I could without you know, causing disturbance or driving my vehicle off the road. And so every night, we used to sleep as close as I could, and the radio collar had an activity sensor. And um, the activity sensor said they were sleeping or resting. So because they get out of bed at 4.30 in the morning, I wasn't going to, I just would lie with this thing going ding, ding, and the second it went ding, 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 I was up. First thing in the morning, I want to go to the restroom. Of course, in Bush, there's no real restroom, but you find somewhere. And, uh, and, and so I'm going to the restroom, and uh, I I'm get, get to that point where your trousers are down by your ankles. <laughs> it has to happen, by the way. And, 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 and the whole pack of dogs appeared. <laughs> and there was 11 of them. And I can challenge any of you, you can't escape in that position. It's like handcuffed, you know? <laughs> And, 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 and they surrounded me, and they came closer and closer, and I'm like, well, Mum, we're going to find out now. <laughs> and they got to a point where, literally, I almost felt I could have touched them all. And I'm like, I think I just added a bit to my pile, the smell was intense, and they drove, they, I drove them away. Well, I didn't, they just walked away. I then wrote to Mum and said, dear Mum, one myth busted, you know? <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm sticking with these guys. But then, in that same study, in that same early days, uh, I was doing one of these follows, and, and what was re I was really beginning to find information that everything w w was written was not true. And the next thing that was that I was following a pack one evening, and I suddenly hear this huge interaction between lions and painted dogs. And by the sound of it, you don't need to be a rocket scientist. One dog or two or three had been seriously damaged because there were some horrible noises coming out of there. I wasn't actually visualizing it. In my head, I was. So I get in there, and the, the lion, when, when the lions are gone, and I get there, and there is a dog lying on the ground, can't lift his head. He's been mauled by a lion. He's as good as, as, good as dead. Uh, it just happened that there was a vet doing rhino work n not far away. I managed to get, I said, what can you do? What can we do? You know? And the vet looked at one look at the dog, and, and OK, I suppose maybe he was older school or whatever, we think differently. And he looked and said, but it's nature. 
And I'm kind of like, e, you know, there's welfare issues, you know, there's all sorts of other issues that we can discuss. They're endangered, and why are they endangered? Because the farmers just shot 20 out of 24, and, you know. <laughs> and uh, he walked away, and I had to go by his decision. Well, I went, you know, went back to my bedroll that night, and first thing in the morning, I went to daylight now again, and I went to have a look. And the carcass was gone, uh, and there was a drag mark, and I'm like, oh, well. Hyenas probably came in the night, he must have died in the night. And um, I suddenly carried on following the pack, and then I suddenly noticed that one dog kept disappearing somewhere. But he didn't have a collar, and so I, I engaged a tracker, another, another person. We, you know, I can track, but trackers, you work as a team of two. You don't, one on your own, you're not very effective. When there's two of you, you can really move far. So we, we decided one day I was going to track this dog called Circus, who one day we're going to write a book about Circus, but that's another story altogether. And uh, we tracked him. We tracked him for f f a point five miles away. And to my disbelief, under a thicket of bush was his brother. But his brother wasn't dead. He was going there every day. He's feeding and cleaning his wounds. This was the first case where we had a species actually looking after their sick and their weak. And I found out over the years it wasn't an isolated incident. And what I'm going to share with you now is a picture that is 33 years old. That is the very dog three months after the lion attack. And now, now that looks bad enough, so you can imagine what it actually looked like on day one. By the way, um, myth number two busted. I actually found subsequently that painted dogs are really... They will assign one member of the pack to be Doc. I had a pack where there were six mauled by a huge punch-up. The dogs were fight protecting pups, and they came back looking like they'd been through World War III. And one dog was assigned, and every hour that dog would wake up and go and lick all the other six dogs, clean up their wounds, and then go back to sleep again, and then set his alarm again an hour later. Incredible. And I'm going to share with you a little bit of the, the organisation of the painted dog, because it's one of my favourite clips, which shows exactly how good they are and how organized they are and this video portrays it very clearly what we've got here is a pack of dogs minding their own business uh, that little bit of green to the right there is a thicket of bush and in the middle of that they've got their pups trying to keep them safe there's four dogs in the front but there's another half a dozen more around the back and hyenas come to try and snag pups well the team mounts, the painted dog team mounts a response that is so organized, it's almost like you know, your first best Super Bowl match where someone goes 98 and every single player knows exactly. Oh, what happened there? Is it? So here we go. Never mind. So here you've got the dogs have just seen trouble. That's a hyena, by the way. He actually needs this video and he's I've no idea what the elephants are doing in the background, the spectators. Um, and at this, some point, one dog gives that thing. No idea what the elephants are doing. I think they don't agree with the referee, you know. I mean, there's always somebody, isn't there? Every football game, someone's complaining about, you know, about the result. You know. Anyway, so, so, so this is... Uh, but it gives you a flavour of what an amazing species the painted dogs are. I could go on all day, as I said, but don't tempt me, because I'll, I'll be here tonight. I know, aren't they ugly? Painted dogs. Well, OK, let me just share with you a little bit more about the amazing social system. These... Pups here are three weeks old. They're on solid food. They're just regurgitating. Uh, in, the, in the wild, every member of the pack helps take care of the pups. Um, but interestingly, these pups already, as, as they start to grow, from the time they're about eight weeks old, they start choosing their future leader at that age. And it, it, it's incredible to watch. And we, as mere human beings, can tell who the future leaders are, the future alphas. And they're not the puppy that's beating up on somebody. 
They're the puppy that's the boldest, that shows the most initiative. You know, when the pups see a new stimuli, like a tortoise or something, and they're all going, oh, scared, and there'll be the, and what we call the emerging alphas, if we want to go, check it out, yep, it's safe, or no, it's not safe. And then those are the dogs, male or female, in that litter, that when they get the time to form their own pack, they will follow that dog. So they're looking for the smartest, the boldest, and there is never no such thing as a leadership contest that goes on for about three or four years with all sorts of slanging matches and God knows what. Can't think where that would happen in the world, but it does. Um, and and they, the painted dogs, a lot of our data, as you now know, comes from camera traps. <laughs> That's what we do, you know, it's non-invasive. And the thing is, you get information that you would never get any other way. Because here we've got pups that are two weeks old suckling with the alpha female and she's obviously given a signal to the rest of the pack to say, I want to st it's time to start weaning the pups. And they drop little bits of meat and wait for the... Um, these are guys, they're probably saying, I bet you he goes for my piece of meat first, you know. That's what <laughs> sort of daft things us guys do from time to time, you know. But seriously, and then slowly but surely, one or two pups gets the hang of the meat, and before you know it, uh, mum's free from being suckled. Because in, basically, she has to stop suckling really fast. By three weeks, she has three or four weeks, she has to be done, because the metabolic rate of, uh, and the draw of these guys is two or three times that of a domestic dog. So, you know, there's only so much, you know, she, she will just die of eclampsia. And I'm going to share a little bit about that, because we had uh, an operation that we were doing this year. We called it Operation Anne. Um, the dog had been named after Anne two years, the alpha female had been named after Anne two years ago, um, a, a lady called Anne Warner. Uh, and, um, and what happened was, was that the pack was small. Had been, we, some dogs had been hit by cars, and then they kind of formed this coalition that wasn't good, not that it wasn't solid, but hey, we only just worked together for a short while. And we started to, we monitored, and Anne was at that point, when I saw those puppy pictures that James was showing, we got alerted that there was a den. We actually, every single year, we pay out a $400 reward for anyone who finds a den, because if they find it, we can protect it. You know, once, once I'm there, we can stop it from, there's all sorts of stuff that goes on at dens that we don't want to know about. And well, she, but I'm going to be sharing some of it. And we get there, and Anne clearly had just had five puppies. They were literally being just born. They were those, like those little, you know, black squiggles. And uh, but the, the the camera chat picture of Anne showed that she was starving. There was, she looked like you know some some stray dog that someone's been you know, starving. And, she, and we knew that she was not going to make it. Well, she might die of eclampsia, which is a lactation condition, or the pups were definitely going to die. And so we, we went on an Operation Anne, gave you some idea of some things we're doing, and we contacted National Parks and we said, can we supplementary feed? Because quite often there's this tactic, oh, let's just dig the puppies out of the den and let's bottle feed. That's not conservation. That doesn't solve the problem. You know, we're trying to keep painted dogs in the wild. You know, and, and often then animals dug out of the wild anyway just become a tourist attraction and they never actually form a conservation value. And um, so, so um, we contact national parks. Now this is one of the beauties. People often say to me, and I always ask, does government support you? Government doesn't have money. But when I contact them and say, can I go into a supplementary feed program for this endangered species, I get an answer immediately. Yes, Greg, go for it. That's, that's support. Without that kind of support, I could have all the support and money in the world. I couldn't spend it wisely. So we could start a supplementary feed program and continue to monitor using camera trap. There were five pups born. And when they went nomadic at 12 weeks, five pups were still alive. And as you can see, very unhealthy looking, actually fat. Uh, this, this, again, talking about... This dog, by looking at the camera traps, this is another Magellan, <laughs> completely. All the pack are doing something else, and Magellan's digging a hole. 
And that was his hole, by the way. Yeah. And so he's guarding his hole. So just to, you know, and the stuff we get from the camera traps is, is absolutely priceless. Well, so we successfully, Operation Anne, so far, has been a success. But just to share with you, while I'm here, we've got a satellite collar on Anne. And wherever Anne goes, the second she goes anywhere near a village, human habitation, my team goes there, goes to that fix, drives there, takes the whole team, they camp out for two or three days, and they'll talk to the people. And in fact, thanks to Dr. James and his wonderful uh, program, we're now going to be developing a, a questionnaire to, ask, you know, to help us un understand what we need to do to make the community support us and the dogs in our, in our quest. Some of the res other factors are something that's really close to my heart, of course. Why does it keep doing this? <laughs> I hate you. I'm going to start hitting, hit, just tap using my finger, I think. Uh, there. Uh, it keeps going out of play. Well, anyway, so what do we do in the field, apart from following painted dogs around? Well, one of the things that everyone knows that I'm absolutely passionate about is feces. I have a complete, <laughs> absolute obsession with feces. Uh, don't, uh, don't, don't send me to some psychologist or something, or, you know, so I need to go to a psychiatrist. Because then I get genetic material, we get parasites, we, we get stress hormones, and we know what the dogs have had for dinner. But more importantly, Part of my big mission is to make my students as equally passionate about feces as I am. <laughs> and if I can achieve that goal, I've got them for life. Let me tell you. And they all take to it. It's amazing, like ducks to water, you know? Once I get them onto the fecal trail, my God, they're just as excited as, as I am. But what is, my, what is my bigger mission with all these young students? My bigger mission is to get young students to be tomorrow's conservation biologists, to meet them, either the biologist, they can be a biologist as a Magellan, or they can be a biologist as an emerging alpha in the conservation leaders. We need them in every shape and form. And I'm particularly passionate and delighted to say that I've taken some of the first women through master's programs and bachelor's programs. And because in Africa, that is not... A lot of them never get that far, right? Because unfortunately, you know, the country is way back. And like my mother, for example, was denied an education for the same reason in England. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about my, my student program. Um, I'm very proud of my students. Uh, and um, other problems we're ch facing are, are snares. Um, snares, by the way, are not set for painted dogs. They're actually as part of the bushmeat trade, and painted dogs are an innocent bycatch. But, you know, it's no good saying, oh, but I didn't really want to catch you, you know. Um, this particular, and wherever we can, we um, fit, <coughs> we dart them, take off the snares. But, you know, that isn't solving the problem for painted dogs. And so, a few years ago, when I was in LA with um, my goddaughter, uh, it was Halloween, and I came up with this idea uh, that to, to trial and see whether we could build a collar that would protect painted dogs against snares, certainly in the high vulnerable areas. I'm very serious there. This is not a joke, man. And so I get, again, as a scientist, I get volunteers to help me. And in this particular case, we had five dogs, domestic dogs, volunteered, or were volunteered, um, <laughs> to test our, our different designs. And the great thing was, was that I uh, just had to pay some respects. Again, these partnerships, Houston Zoo got involved. And then Jill, uh, an animal, Jill Slavin Professional Animals, it's an organization that trains dogs, you know, for movies and, and adverts, etc. But the bless, bless the guy's heart, none of the dogs were ever like, oh, you've earned my money, now you're, you know, like a racing horse that said, oh, you've, you've done your job, so goodbye. He kept them for life. And um, because obviously, you know, it's, we have to know what, we, we can't just be spending money on great ideas. We have to test our great ideas, uh, test our ideas, and hopefully they turn out to be great. And just to share with you, in case you think that there were those dogs were being snared, uh, and, and welfare issue was at stake. 
By the way, the only welfare issue, I think, was for the keepers, the handlers, because they had to keep recording data. And they weren't used to doing that. And uh, when I told them that each dog had to run through the snare trap 100 times for each design of collar, because we have something in science called end sample, they were like, the dogs won't want to do it. It's, I'm, like, I'm like, no, I'm thinking to myself, I bet the dogs do want to do it, but you don't want to record 100 times. <laughs> well, anyway, so finally, after much toing and froing, they tried it, and the dogs wouldn't stop doing it. You know, we had a 14-year-old female that she couldn't... She was like she was, like she was on the Olympics, you know, like, pew, pew. Um, Anyway, I think I just dropped my headphone thingy, never mind. And um, so, um, this is what it looked like. So, we had different designs, and every design, if we felt that any bit of the hardware was superfluous, we would remove it and ship, run again. This is what it looked like. And that wire would just separate as soon as the dog, had, it showed us where it went. Uh, and then the handlers would have to score exactly where did it end up. And in fact, the early collars, we, we realized that the failure was happening here, and it was going right the way over. And all we did was have to open that up slightly and we went from 65% successful to a 91% success rate. So we figured it was worth finding our first candidate. And this was the dog we called Kettle. You can see, poor, poor fellow, snared around here, got a horrible wire that he's broken. He's in a body of water. We called him Kettle because the first time we saw him, there were bubbles coming out of the water, and we, uh, we weren't sure what it was when we anaesthetized him to put the, get the snare off, we found out that his windpipe was cut. <laughs> Give you some idea how we operate. What, how do we manage a situation like that in the field? Well, I'm immediately, I always carry a satellite phone. I called, you know, I have a vet, a vet that I'll call out of bed at any time of the day and just say, right, this is what I've got, you know, tell me what to do. And, you know, the vet led me through exactly what I had to do and I did what I was told, of course. And that's the same dog. And uh, two and a half years later, he's fine. And, and that's the snare wire, by the way. Those, those artifacts at the back are made from snare wire. Uh, and that's how we, apart from providing artisans with um, people, community, with jobs. And we pay a lot of money goes out every single year. And we make sure they get a fair, you know, a fair wage. Um, oh, and here they are, yes. We haven't got many, but um, if you all want them, uh, I'm sure we can send some more. Oop. Just to share with you, the other problem we have, a roadkill. This is a huge exercise that we're doing at the moment. Dogs, and in fact, I started our road traffic mitigation program because the um, uh, dogs were being killed at such an alarming rate, we have a section of highway that runs through a national park, high-speed road. So what are we doing as scientists? Well, we collect data on vehicle classes, we collect data by company, uh, and now we're actually, all the companies are going to get a very polite letter saying, do you know where you sit in the continuum of this? Uh, we put up road signage, We've also got, actually, as I speak, my merry team are at the Botswana border talking, thanks to James and his team, talking to motorists and asking them all sorts of questions that we will then uh, analyse and see how can we do better in our, uh, our approach to conserving them. We put up road signs. We measured the difference after road signs and found that it made a big difference to the Zimbabweans, but it made no difference whatsoever to the South Africans, the Namibians, the Botswanans, because we'd had a PR campaign. But interestingly, then I'm talking to the... I've got new friends, like the police, the chief of police, the very big guy for the whole region, and we're talking about it, and I said, what else can we do from a law enforcement side? And he said, well, surveillance. And then I said, I, I said, well, maybe we can put up some dummy cameras. He said, let's try and get permission. He said, but if you do, he said... I want a, a billboard. And I said, what do you want the billboard to be? This is chief of police. He said, you put this one up. He said, all the, all the, all the non-Zimbabwean vehicles will slow down immediately. 
road under surveillance. <laughs> uh, you know, well, you know, I, I wouldn't have thought of that. It's by sharing ideas, and he's right. You know, the, the non-Zimbabweans will see that and go, whoa. You know, I mean, we all, let's face it, in other, someone else's country, we're far more respectful than we might be in our own country. We have issues with um, just dens disturbed and not disturbed. Um, and um, so we are finalizing our data on that. We've actually found out, I've got a PhD student working on this, we've actually now, it's clear that when dens are disturbed by tour operators, film crews, or researchers pretending to be researchers but just enjoying looking at the dogs, that the pups don't get fed properly. They end up with leg lengths that are uh, compromised. That should be 100%, that should be not 91%. So short legs, uh, and they don't grow properly. We're actually, and even as adults, we now know that pups born at dens that were disturbed so we need these data. We can't make change without these data. If we try to make change, someone will say, prove it. And so, well, we can, and we're going to be working on that. So just to break through a little bit about our community-based conservation and my visions, um, everything we do at our center, we try to be as carbon neutral as possible. You know, practice what you preach. If I'm preaching conservation, let me be, do, do conservation. Uh, anything from water harvesting, teaching the kids about water harvesting, um, to, to providing buildings that are friendly to not only the community, because all this grass comes from the women, and that incidentally, the women, the local village women, their major income every year, that they get, that's where they get all their money for the year is cutting grass. And so, by doing that, in fact, one of the first things when we moved into the area and they granted us this piece of land, they said, uh, what are your roofs going to be made of? <laughs> you know, and if I'd said tin, they'd have said, well, hold on a minute. <laughs> what good are you to us? Uh, we're very busy trying to work at all levels, uh, uh, training not just young graduate students, but um, training rangers, you know, and interestingly, finding out from rangers what do they need to be more effective in their, in their job. And, and we actually had a great workshop where we identified all the things, and then we know what we can deliver. And in fact, interestingly, we had a, I had a secret ballot system where everyone was given a sticky notepad so they could just write on and put it in a bucket. So whatever you thought, no one was going to know it was your question or your answer. And it turned out that one of the things that most of these rangers really want to know is how to swim. <laughs> so many. They're working on the Zambezi River and then they lose a whole boatload of people. You know, something as simple as that. You, you know, you, we've identified it now and we're trying to work out how we're going to solve it that all the rangers go on. Well, you know, what a waste. You know, you've got to train half a dozen trained people who are fighting for wildlife, and what are we doing? And they all die in a boat because they can't swim. Um, you're also training trainers. Um, that Zulu, our education guy, kind of teach teachers how to integrate um, cons conservation into their lesson planning, um, and particularly with the, you know, with, the, you know, with the primary school. And also trying to teach the teachers how to be more child-centric. Child you know, a lot of the teachers are a bit like, I'm sure someone here has seen Mrs. Doubtfire, where you've got that, you know, that old guy with his dinosaur, you know. Well, some of our teachers are a bit like that, you know, and they need a little bit of flavor into their lesson planning. Of course, I started something like that one or two years ago. Um, <laughs> that was me in the very early days. Um, uh, when I couldn't find dogs, I could always find children to talk to. Um, <laughs> Crazily, I remember, and I also have a dog and pony show where I put a dog suit on and I put all the kids in these little dog suits. And, and, and I, I had a student who came to me. She's actually just finished her master's. And she came to me some years ago and she said, Greg, I want to join you. And I always do my usual. I put up as many blockers as possible, but I'm not really blocking you. I'm just seeing how, how serious you are to join me. Anyway, she floored me and... And I said, OK, you can join me. And on the first day, 
her first thing was, do you remember me? And I said, no, really, I'll be honest, I, I don't. She said, I remember you. She said, you came into my classroom when I was nine years old. And from that day on, I wanted to be a wildlife biologist. <laughs> and I thought, poor girl. But anyway, you know, <laughs> I'm your role model, oh my God. <laughs> uh, so I'm very busy, you know, I want to have as many, try and do everything we can to engender this into kids, uh, kids for science program. Uh, we're also um, uh, raising funds at the moment, uh, so you can all go and rob a few banks if you'd like, um, to try and get a, a, a field vehicle to take group, large groups of kids into the field. This is from my former project, Paint PDC, uh, where I built a bush camp. It was one of the best things I ever did in my life. So now I'm just building another one. You know, you, we need them everywhere, anywhere, like mushrooms. I'm very committed to women in science, as I've told you. And here's a le another lady who completed her master's. Um, and in fact, one of my master's, my, another lady that's just completed a master's, she had three universities in England offering her full scholarships. And uh, she, she blamed, attributed some of that to me, or all of it. I said, you can't do that. You take the ticket, man. And, but here we go. When I've got a young lady like that, who writes, from a tender age, she dreamed of being a scientist who had worked, worked tirelessly to make a difference. If I can't support someone like that, there's something wrong with me. And I'm committed to doing so. And as a final, another of our kind of poster childs, some years ago, headmaster from the local village school came to me and he said, oh, he said, Dr. Greg, he said, I, I've got this student, her name's La Suita, and he said, um, her mum's going to take her away from school. I said, why? Uh, he said, well, you know, mother says she's got no money. He said, but you know the real reason. I said, yes, I do. And the real reason, of course, is she'd just go back to the homestead and sweep the floor and look off some kids and chickens and this and that and the other. And uh, so I said, oh, I've got a program for that. I didn't, but I did now. <laughs> and um, so I have her mother come, La Suita's mum and La Suita, so I immediately just said to her mother, I said, um, by the way, I said, why are you taking La Suita from school? Oh, there's no money. I'm like, oh, we can solve that. <laughs> and uh, solve it we did. I said, so school term started, so I said, it's pointless her going to school now. I said, let her do an internship with us for nine months, which then, of course, means we can get computer skills in, English skills, you know, ready. I said, and then we'll cover her final school years, final two and a half years at school. I said, and if she passes, you know, obviously we'll see if we can get her through to university um, and cover that. Well, here is La Suita. She's now in her third year at university, uh, passing with flying colours and um, on the way to being the first woman ever in our rural community of about 3,000 people to go to, to university. No surprises, she's dead proud of herself. <laughs> Initially, her mother was kind of against the idea, you know, and tried to talk her daughter out of, well, you know, you can just finish. When the kids have grown up, you can, any time you can go back to university. And Sweeter said, I'm not doing it, Mum. You know, I've got this, I've got somewhere to go. And uh, so our vision for the future is to build a conservation ecology centre. It's still just a slab of concrete at the moment. And um, this is, will be, in my mind, the home for science. Just to wrap up now, from where I, the beginning, uh, in 1988, the Zimbabwean population was less than 200 dogs. After 33 years of ferocious conservation work in every single direction, in 2018, the number was 750. We can make a difference. We can't do it alone, so please support us and all go rob banks. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>